It is estimated that between 30 and 60 million bison roamed the North American plains in the early 1800s, and then by 1889, there were just 541 of them left. At that point, recovery efforts began, and it is estimated that roughly 31,000 wild bison now roam public lands in North America again, along with about 500,000 bison currently existing on private lands. Of the privately owned bison, about 2,500 of them roam here in Campbell County at the Durham Bison Ranch. On this inaugural episode of Explore 17, we find out how a California butcher family found its way to owning a Wyoming bison ranch and what it takes to run that ranch today as we sit down with owner John Flochini. My grandfather on the paternal side came from Italy. He, he immigrated as a young child, young boy, into Northern California where some of his uncles had already immigrated and they were uh, dairy farmers in Northern California. And so my grandfather at one point uh, moved down to the Bay Area and he hung around the San Francisco area and became a calf skinner of all things. Um, he would ride his motorcycle from butcher shop to butcher shop and skin calves for the, the shops there in San Francisco. And he got to know, you know, the circuit. He got to know the, the guys that had the meat companies um, in the old butcher shops in San Francisco and became friends particularly with one company called Dura Meat Company. And the owner of that company, you know, took my grandfather in and gave him a job, kind of showed him the ropes. And then basically in the 1930s, um, he invited my grandfather to buy him out of the business. So that was kind of our entry into my family's entry into the meat business and um, into the history of Durham Meat Company and the name Durham for our family. That company, that Durham Meat Company, dated back to the 1880s in San Francisco. So it was an old institution in San Francisco. My father and my uncle both became involved um, and my aunt actually. So my grandfather and my grandparents, three kids um, became involved in the business. You know, back then it was mostly, well, a lot of what they did was contracts for the army, actually selling beef to the army. And they would do car loads, which are 40,000 pound train car loads of cut steaks for army bases. And back in the 60s, um, they were looking to integrate the business, sort of do some vertical integration. And they were looking for ranches to buy cattle ranches because most of the business we did at that time was beef. Really, well, beef, veal, lamb, pork, domestic, the domestic um, species. Bison were definitely not on the radar at that time, but they happened to come across a deal through a friend um, on this, this ranch opportunity here in Wyoming. And so the, the guy at the time who was leasing the ranch from the Wright family um, actually was the one that brought the bison onto the ranch in the early 1960s, was looking for a partner. We uh, made a deal with the guy. We um, ended up um, buying the ranch out from um, from the partnership, um, and we ended up with with the ranch after a year or two of of partnering with the guy. So once we bought the ranch, um, I was seven or eight years old. My parents would bring us the family, load us up in the station wagon in the summer, and we would spend our summer vacations out here on the ranch a couple weeks. And so from a very young age, um, we would, you know, have these fun experiences out here in the summer. And we all, my whole family, fell in love with the ranch. I particularly did to the point where I 
felt like I wanted to pursue spending more time on the ranch as a kid growing up. And so I would actually spend parts of my summer on the ranch living with my grandparents who would spend parts of their summer at the ranch as well. Um, my father at that point was uh, running the company back in California, so it allowed my grandfather some free time to get away more. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would basically live with my grandparents here on the ranch. My grandfather would um, help teach me about ranching. And I would come home in the evenings and my grandmother, who was a wonderful Italian cook, would have these incredible meals. And I just, you know, it was a great combination for me. Um, learning, you know, m having my grandfather mentor me on ranching and also learning from the other people we had on the ranch at the time. My dad and my grandfather and I went on a three generation hunt actually up in the uh, Canadian Yukon and it was just at the beginning of my senior year in high school and my father out you know in the middle of nowhere literally um, in the Yukon out you know under the stars by a campfire one night asked me what I wanted to do and you know going on with my life. Uh, you know, and, and my folks had definitely encouraged us, you know, the importance of education was obvious. And um, so we talked about college and, you know, it's a little bit of a funny story, but I asked my dad for some input on what he thought I might, you know, should do. And he thought about it for a minute or two and he said, well, we could use a lawyer in the family. And I just kind of chuckled. And I said, well, uh, I have some different ideas. <laughs> and uh, that's when I told him about that I would like to entertain, you know, going to college, getting a degree in agriculture, and coming out to the ranch to live. My dad uh, thought it was a wonderful idea. He, you know, had his full blessing on that. Um, I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, got a degree in ag, and then started my life out here on the ranch full-time in the early 80s. My grandparents would always go to bison conferences and they at one point started taking me to bison conferences with them. So I also fell in love with sort of the bison world and the people um, that were affiliated with raising bison. And so, so, so definitely the bison was a, was a big part of the equation of what I love so much about this place, but just the wide open spaces, the expanse, um, the natural beauty here, the sunsets, the sunrises, um, the cowboy way of life, um, it just all had a great appeal to me. When I moved to the ranch full time, there was no family members living here. So for the first several years of my time here, um, I was kind of just learning the year round ropes. Of, of the ranch life, what responsibilities there are in the ranch, what needed to be done when. Was that, at that point in time, I'd only basically spent summers here. And so there's a lot more to a ranch than just summers. And then um, in the uh, mid 80s, I was introduced to a concept called holistic management. And um, a guy by the name of Alan Savory, who wrote the book basically on holistic management. Um, I heard him speak at a conference in Casper. It was a three-day workshop called Holistic Ranch Management. And um, I had actually heard of the guy when I was in college. Uh, you know, there was a a great, I took a class in grazing management and, and they, they investigated different methods of grazing, um, primarily cattle grazing. And there was this method called the savory grazing method that, um, you know, one of, one of the things I remembered about it was that uh, typically in this grazing system, there would be wagon wheels set up and um, the hub would be a central water point where all of the pastures would come to in the shape of a wagon wheel. And so a very effective and efficient 
um, use of infrastructure for one, but also um, abilities to graze animals sort of in a high uh, stock density and then also facilitate movement. Uh, basically, when they come into the hub, you just have the gate open to go to the next pasture and the animals can move themselves. So I remember hearing about that and learning about that when I was in college, um, but I really didn't know much about the bigger picture of what the, what Savory was, um, what, what he put together and the, the holistic management aspect of it. Whole, you know, being the, the whole entity, um, community, et cetera, that you're uh, managing. So when I heard Alan speak in Casper, I was floored, basically, to be honest. Um, that winter, we signed up for a course. My dad and I, we both went to Albuquerque, met there, um, and went to uh, one of these seven-day courses. And it basically changed um, the way we did things from that point forward. And so, you know, I guess if I could come up with one thing that, you know, looked like I put my personal stamp on the ranch and, you know, my efforts here for the family, it was introducing my family and the ranch to holistic management. Part of having a successful ranch is more than just making sure the bison are being cared for. There is a business side of the ranch as well. So the, the current um, mix, if you will, is roughly 70% of our sales go into um, food service. So it would be mainly restaurants. We, we, and we supply restaurants from coast to coast. And then the other 30% would be retail. So going into grocery stores, health food stores, that sort of thing. We're working on building up our retail. So back in the 80s, um, my uncle introduced uh, a, a line of specialty meats into our meat company with the acquisition of a, of a, it was another San Francisco meat company called Nightbird. And Nightbird specialized in um, species like elk and venison, um, primarily uh, imported from New Zealand, from the deer farmers there. And so where that has evolved um, in the company has been a, a line of what we call specialty products, uh, um, natural and sustainable. And the bison has become kind of the anchor species for that line. So currently, and this is all sold under the Durham Ranch brand. So bison as the anchor, a line of uh, Wagyu cattle, um, Wagyu beef, uh, the elk and venison, as I mentioned, and then wild boar. And we do sell those via retail. It, it has become quite popular, um, especially recently, more recently with um, um, people into CrossFit and those sorts of things, the meat eaters, diets and whatnot. They seek out, folks that are into that, seek out non-traditional red meat. And, you know, these sorts of specialty meats fit really well into that. Um, they're, they're very healthy. They're very lean. Um, bison meat is, is low in cholesterol, it's high in protein, it's high in iron, um, low fat, and similar to the other species such as the elk and the venison and the wild boar. Wagyu, on the other hand, is more of a, a different eating experience, not folks necessarily looking for very lean protein because Wagyu, also known as Kobe beef, um, comes from Japan. It's a breed of Japanese beef, and um, its forte is very intense, high marbling in the meat. Um, so that's a little different specialty meat, um, a little different eating experience. It's estimated that there are currently 107 million cattle being raised in North America, Compared to the half million bison being raised, John discusses some of the differences and similarities between raising the two types of animals. 
some of the differences between raising bison and, and beef cattle on a ranch. Bison are still very much in touch with their natural instincts, so they, they take care of themselves really well. Um, especially in this part of the country, um, they evolved um, in middle America, um, and they know how to handle basically everything that nature throws at them. So whether it's weather related, you know, blizzards, 100 degree heat, um, they know how to handle it. They've evolved with it. Um, whether it's uh, the wolf as a predator um, or any other predator, um, they're just, the way they're built, the way they're designed, their bodies with a large hump, the big, huge heads, they take, they face their dangers, their threats, head on. So whether it's a blizzard, which they face into, um, or if it's a wolf, which they'll face off, or fighting one another um, in the rut, the bulls will fight with each other. Their hides are two to three times thicker on the front end versus the rear end. So they just are built to take all the danger head on. Part of the, part of the reason why that is, is so they can look and face the danger so they know what's coming, including in a blizzard. Um, so comparatively, cattle, um, sheep, um, horses, when they're in a blizzard or a storm, they tend to turn tail to it. Um, they don't want, they're not built to face into those storms. And the bison, well, what happens with cattle or sheep, they start drifting um, when they turn tail to the storm. They'll drift with the wind. And many times, we've seen it here in these bat, in the worst blizzards that we've had here, they'll get themselves into a corner where they can't move any further and they bunch up or off of a, a draw, into a draw, and literally the snow will drift right over the top of them. And it, uh, it kills them, it suffocates them. Where bison will stand like a statue facing into the wind until the storm breaks. And then they split up, drift away, and you know go to grazing again. Other differences, um, they don't need feed. Um, we, while we do put out some supplement feed to help them get through the winter time um, with, you know, so they don't lose quite as much weight, we let them lose weight. We think it's good for them to lose weight. It's natural for them to lose weight over the winter. Um, we're asking them to produce, the cows to produce every year for us. In nature, um, all they needed to do was survive as a species, so they didn't have to produce every year. If it was a bad winter, they may not um, come back and breed the following year. So while we're trying to make a living off of them and support families in a sustainable way, we need them to produce every year for us. So we put a little bit of feed out over the winter so they don't lose quite as much weight so that when the spring comes and the grass turns green, um, they bounce back a little bit quicker and are able to not only um, do a good job of raising the calf that they have that spring, but also they can come into good enough flesh to breed back after that calf that you know hits the ground that's next to them so that they can have a calf the following year. Some of the challenging things, difference, there, differences there are between them and cattle, um, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster. So our handling facilities have to be designed and built to handle that. Um, our perimeter fencing is bigger and stronger and taller um, because bison are more athletic and um, so most of our outside fencing, our perimeter fencing is five and a half to six feet tall. Um, and our corral facilities are very impressive, very, you know, six feet, minimum six feet, some, some of it seven feet tall, um, and all out of either concrete and heavy pipe or just heavy pipe and, and steel. Anecdotally, observationally, bison are similar to the way the cattle graze, or, or maybe vice versa, because our cattle here basically were imported um, many years ago from Europe, and 
bison are natural born grazers um, and they have a tendency to forage a little bit differently than cattle will. So they'll, they'll utilize more broadleaf species, more weeds and whatnot, if you will, than cattle will. And they have a, their instinct is to balance their diet um, nutritionally. So they're seeking out different plants, including weeds, uh, to help um, balance the nutritional requirements that they have on a year-round basis. Um, otherwise, just as an animal-to-animal -animal comparison, they sort of both impact the land the same. They're both large, split, hoof, ungulate grazing animals. So a lot of, a lot of how they impact the land is how they are managed on the land, regardless of whether they're bison or cattle. Sort of the life cycle of a bison, um, calves are born in the spring, primarily April and May. Um, then the breeding or the rut, the breeding season is mostly during July and August. There's a nine month gestation period. So uh, cows will breed in July and August, have those calves in April and May. Um, here at the ranch, um, roughly early November of the year, we do our annual roundup where we gather all of the bison um, on the ranch and we run them all through our, our corral facility, our handling facility, basically handle them once a year. Um, at that time, we wean the calves and pregnancy test the, the cows, the females. Those are the two primary reasons why we have the, the fall roundup. Usually, the cows that are not pregnant are culled out of the herd and utilized for meat. Um, the cows that are bred are kept. So the calves, after they're weaned from their mothers, go right out on back on the pasture that same day. They, they come off the pasture. We want them to go back to the same, you know, eating environment that they were in when they came in with their mothers. So the only difference is they basically don't have their mother by their side. They're still exposed to the same grass that they were eating before they came in, which is an important um, aspect of a healthy weaning process. We'll bring the calf group back in through the handling facility after they've settled down for a couple weeks. We give them a chance to, to kind of get over the initial stress of being weaned. And, um, and then we bring them back through the corrals. And basically what we're doing there is, you know, an official count on how many calves we have. We're also um, checking the sex on the animals. So we figure out how many heifers we have, how many bulls we have. Um, we also weigh them all. Um, we also do a preliminary kind of a first pick on our potential replacement bulls. We keep all of our own um, replacement bulls for breeding. Those, along with the heifers, go back out onto grass. Um, for the rest of the winter, we feed them some hay and a couple pounds of cake over the winter. And um, the, the, the rest of the bulls, uh, you know, notwithstanding the 75 potential replacement breeding bulls, then we consider those to be meat animals. Those guys go into our meat program. In our meat program, we go back out on grass with those and we start them on a free choice uh, grain program where they have access to grass, they have access to hay, and they have access to a grain pellet um, on a 24-7 basis. Um, we slowly but surely work those guys off um, of, out of the pastures and into um, large pens, if you will, where then they um, basically go on a free choice diet of a couple different kinds of hay as well as the grain supplement that's that's out there for them. Um, and then we carry those through that process until they get big enough um, to harvest them. And our target weight on those bulls is 1,100 pounds, live weight. Um, and then the potential replacement bulls, along with the heifers, graze out through the winter with some feed supplement, as I mentioned. 
we bring those guys all back through in the spring again, reweigh them, um, and vaccinate the heifers for brucellosis. And, um, and then we basically assess our grass situation on the ranch to um, give us confidence that we believe we're gonna have enough grass for the, win for the coming season, the, the growing season, um, in order to put the calves, which are now year old, back in to the breeding herd with uh, the mamas that they were weaned off from a few months before. Um, majority of the time we have enough grass and that yearling herd goes back into the breeding herd to run with the breeding herd for the growing season. Um, this year was um, an exception to that because we determined in the spring we were not going to have enough grass. Um, it was obvious we didn't have much carryover forage from last year's drought and uh, the forecast was not good and the amount of precip we had had up to that point in the spring was not good. Um, so we made the decision to pull that whole yearling herd off the grass. Pretty dramatic thing. I don't think I've ever done it. I don't think we've ever done it since I've been here. There were 600 animals. Basically, we took them off the grass, put them in pens, and, and just started feeding them hay. But anyway, um, so we reduced the stock numbers on the ranch, the, the number of mouths eating grass uh, with pulling those yearlings, sending some to grass, and then we have another roughly 100 heifers that are in the corrals just eating hay, and we've been looking for um, trying to sell those as potential breeding heifers to other bison producers around the country. Hunting and egg tourism are a few other things that also happen on the ranch. All of our old breed bulls, when they are coming out of service, we hunt. Uh, we have a hunting program for them. Hunters will come from all over the country. Sometimes, you know, we get some European hunters that'll come to the ranch to hunt a bison. These are, the hunts are on the big, mature, majestic, um, trophy animals. They are trophy hunts. The hunter, though, also gets all the meat, the head and the hide. Um, we have a guest house on the ranch. The hunter comes and spends up to four nights here lodging. We, uh, we guide the hunt. Um, our crew does all the field dressing on the animal, um, all the skinning and quartering. Um, so that's been a, a really good program. There's, I mean, we just haven't had enough bulls for the amount of interest we have. We have an antelope and deer hunting program as well, where hunters come and pay a trespass fee um, to, to hunt. We also have an agritourism enterprise here on the ranch. and. Um, that includes seasonal tours that we do. Um, we do regularly scheduled tours. We work with the Gillette Visitor Center. Um, they book the tours for us. Um, our typical scenario has been two days a week, and uh, we have a small bus that we take folks out on. It's a, about a two-hour tour. Um, our first stop is typically at our corral facility where we get out of the bus. Um, walk the folks around the facilities there, show them what we do, talk about why we do what we do, how it all works, um, and then take the bus out into, basically into the middle of the bison herd. And you know, there may be anywhere around 2,500 to 3,000 bison in that herd. That's really the highlight of the tour. We also have a gift shop on the ranch, um, which uh, is open, Monday through Friday during the season, um, nine to five. Um, we sell all kinds of really cool bison related products. Um, we have local honey from beehives that um, we have at the ranch. Once we're out of the season where the store is no longer open regularly, Monday through Friday, nine to five, we are open by appointment on a year round basis. We have regular customers that come year round and buy bison meat from us. Um, so we have a freezer in the gift shop and we sell an assortment of bison meat. One of the events that we do annually on the ranch 
where we invite people to come to the ranch uh, and support um, a charity event that we have every year. In fact, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary um, this year. It's a 5K, 10K walk run, and we work with a uh, local nonprofit charity that um, actually helps veterans in um, a five county area of Wyoming as well in Northeast Wyoming as well as um, doing educational you know helping with education with youth um, with uh, giving a hand up to um, for helping with food pantries and soup kitchens and things like that for folks the Powder River Energy Foundation is the name of that organization and we've established a partnership with them we have um, four full-time employees, including myself. So three other uh, guys that work here live on the ranch. Um, we provide the housing for them and their families. And um, you know, one of those guys takes care of our fencing. He, he basically is responsible for um, maintaining our fences. Uh, he also uh, is the guy that feeds the cake to our animals when we're feeding it on a daily basis. Um, so he has to get out ahead on the fencing. He has to get out ahead of the herd. We have 85 different pastures. So that's a lot of fencing, over a couple hundred miles of fence on the ranch. And um, so in our grazing plan, we know where the animals are gonna be um, well ahead of time. And so one of his responsibilities is to make sure the fence in the area that they're moving to next is ready to go. He also is in charge of our mineral program. So we have a cafeteria style mineral program where we've built trailers um, that move around with the herd. Wherever the herd goes, the trailers are. And in those trailers, there's a choice of 16 different vitamins and minerals for the animals to select. Um, whatever they want, however much they need of it, they, they make that choice themselves. And again, it's all based on their instinct on being able to determine what they need nutritionally to balance their diets. One of our guys is uh, our mechanic. He keeps our equipment running smooth. We have quite a bit of equipment, for, you know, feed equipment, hay equipment, pickups, um, the tractors. <clears throat> and then another guy, uh, well, sort of my foreman, my right-hand man, He's our grazing manager. Um, he's kind of the guy that I rely on for assessing our pasture conditions, um, you know, responsible for, for updating um, what's going on with our grass, uh, forage availability. He does the grazing planning, which is a big thing. He maintains that. Um, he's kind of the oil that keeps the machine running. Um, me, on the other hand, uh, I spend most of my time in the office unless we're, you know, during our big roundup month in November, uh, during our haying season, um, during the summer. Um, I man the phones, um, the internet, um, the, you know, email inquiries. Uh, I spend most of my days answering phone calls um, and emails, you know, planning more big picture things as well coordinating uh you know shipping our bison um you know those sorts of things as we all have learned in the last couple of years things can change quickly and even though the business model the ranch had been following for many years was working that changed in early 2020 and the ranch is now adapting to make sure it has a strong future when COVID hit a 70 30 worked against us um, we all know what happened with restaurants in the country. Um, a lot of restaurants shut down. Um, a lot of them shriveled up, um, and our demand basically shut down with the restaurants, the majority of it, because that's where the majority of our product was going. Um, so that had a huge impact on, on us, um, on the demand side of our product. And for several months last year, we were producing more than um, was needed or demanded from the uh, from the um, from the marketplace. So um, it it 
forced us to build inventories. We, you know, when you have a live animal that's growing and when they get ready, they're ready. You can't push the pause button. And so you continue to have to harvest the animals regardless of what's going on in the marketplace and the, the, the demand for the animals. So basically we're harvesting the animals last year without the demand for them. So much of the product was being inventoried. Once things opened up this spring, the restaurants all started to open again. Um, things were firing on all cylinders. It got to the point where we found ourselves a little bit short, which is a better problem to have definitely um, than having a lot of money tied up in inventory and meat in, in the freezer, if you will. So um, one of the take homes for us on that experience was that we need to be more diversified in, um, our, in the marketplace, in how we're selling the product. So we've been putting a higher emphasis on trying to expand our retail sales. And so we've got one guy that focuses on, through the meat company that focuses on retail sales. And the bison is one of the big items that, that um, he's focusing on. And he's working nationally from basically from coast to coast. So there's a lot of stuff in the hopper right now. Um, we feel pretty, uh, we feel pretty confident. We feel pretty good about some of the potential um, opportunities that we have coming down the pike. So we look forward to um, moving sort of in that direction a little bit more to balance uh, what we're doing in the marketplace. Um, we are also investigating export markets. Um, you know, Canada, Mexico, um, you know, North America, as well as European markets and Asia potentially. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, we hope to take advantage of some opportunities in that way. For now, we're, we're focusing primarily on, on domestic expansion. Um, as far as the ranch goes future, you know, we've been through droughts in the past, um, maybe not quite as dramatic as the last couple of years, but we know that's part of the natural system. Um, and so we are you know, confident that things will, well, we're going to have some good years ahead. And, um, you know, we'll get to the point again where we have more grass and we have animals to harvest that grass. So we'll more than likely be building the herd back up when that uh, time comes, um, which helps us, you know, on the supply side of things, supplying our own um, product into the marketplace. I guess one of the things I'd like to say is this lifestyle is very fulfilling. I, I feel lucky and blessed to have been able to live most of my life now on the ranch and, you know, to have had the experience of living on the land, with the land, dependent on the land, um, working with animals that are dependent on the land, um, you know, part of that whole circle and, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy lifestyle, but it's a simple one. And there's a lot that can be said about that. Um, you know, waking up to beautiful sunrises, um, you know, saying, you know, good night to beautiful sunsets in the evenings. I've traveled all over the world and, <clears throat> and our sunsets rival anywhere in the world that I've, that I've been to. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of on the level of, of in Africa, you know, some of what the expanse that, um, they experienced. This is a little bit of smaller version maybe of that, but, um, just, just, uh, you know, working with the land, working with the animals, working with great people, a great team, um, that have, you know, all combined to the success of, of, uh, sustainable, business um, for my family, for the families that live on the ranch that have been, you know, participated with us on the ranch. Uh, it's just been a great, complete package for me and my family.